My name is Deepak Srivastava, and I direct the Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease and the Roddenberry Stem Cell Center at Gladstone, and I'm a professor at the University of California in San Francisco. This is the second part uh, of uh, my talk, and uh, in this part, I'll share with you how we can use the developmental biology gene networks that we've discovered to impact not just our understanding of birth defects, but also how we can use that for regenerative medicine approaches through cellular reprogramming. Can we use these developmental pathways we've discovered to somehow take an adult heart and create new muscle in a regenerative approach? And it turns out that the heart, like most other organs, has not only muscle cells, but a number of support cells. In the heart, we call them cardiac fibroblasts. But most other organs in your body have support cells around the functioning cells that are there to form the architecture and support those cells that are necessary for that organ's function. The heart, it turns out, is quite special in this in that it, fully half of the cells in the organ are of these type of cardiac fibroblasts. And those are the same ones that go or activated in the setting of injury and make scar. So what you see here is a heart. Uh, this isn't the case of a mouse, but a human heart is very similar if it's been damaged, say it like in a heart attack, where in red you see normal muscle. And here in the left ventricle you see uh, this broad purple area, which is scar tissue that is present after an injury to the heart. Now, if we wanted to repair this heart, you can tell that the fundamental problem is we've lost muscle. We'd want to add, create new muscle there somehow. And we and others are trying approaches to take the beating heart cells I've showed you before from stem cells and somehow inject them into this heart uh, to create new muscle. Uh, it's turned out that we've had a lot of trouble there by, in terms of getting of those heart cells to stick and persist. And even if we do that to get them to electrically connect with their neighbors so they can beat in synchrony. And so years ago, we asked could we take a different approach and somehow harness the fact that we have this abundant pool of fibroblasts that are already in the organ? Could we somehow trick those cells into not being fibroblasts, but somehow being, turning into new myocytes or reprogram them into new myocytes? And this was really inspired by uh, Shinya Yamanaka's discovery that you could take a skin fibroblast and turn it into a stem cell. So we thought maybe with the right cues, we could take this cardiac fibroblast and right there within the organ, convert its fate into a new cardiac myocyte if we knew the right factors to induce that cell fate switch. So the question is illustrated here. Can we take a cardiac fibroblast and convert it into what we've called an induced cardiomyocyte-like cell? And to do this, we really relied upon all of these developmental biology networks, because we thought we'd learn from nature, how nature normally does it, maybe we could redeploy the key factors in a dish. And that turned out to be the case. When we screened a large number of transcription factors and microRNAs that we knew to be critical for development of the heart, uh, and asked what was the minimal essential cocktail, it turned out to be the three factors that I'm showing you here, two of which we've talked about extensively already, GATA4 and TBX5, and maybe that makes sense now because of what I showed you, that these two proteins sit together to drive cardiac cell fate during embryogenesis. And a third really critical factor, MEF2C, that's also essential for normal cardiac formation in an embryo. So it turned out that these three factors in a dish could push cells towards this cardiac fate, somewhat inefficiently, but broadly reprogram these cells. But what we really wanted to do is know if these three factors could do the trick in the cells that are already in the heart. And uh, it turns out that they can. Uh, so if we take a mouse heart and tie off the coronary artery and induce a heart attack, and do so in a mouse where we can genetically label with a fluorescent protein the fibroblast pool and its progeny, we can then track whether or not we've really converted a resident fibroblast into a new myocyte. And it turns out that we can not only do this, we can do this in a way that the new myocytes that are formed electrically couple with their neighbors. They're most similar to an adult ventricular cardiomyocyte. And most importantly, we were able to show that these new myocytes are sufficient 
to actually improve the cardiac output in these mice after damage by MRI. And if you look at these hearts histologically, where we've done the experiment that you see here, and then wait about three months and take these hearts out and section them, uh, normally after injury, if we just introduce uh, with the virus these, a control gene, a DS red marker, we see a ventricle like you see here with a big, large scar on the free wall of the ventricle uh, that's indicated in blue here. In contrast, when we put these three genes in, we still see a thin wall ventricle. There's scar tissue. But now you can begin to see these uh, areas of red, threads of myocardium, in the scar area. And if you look by this ye yellow fluorescent protein, these all used to be non-myocytes that have now converted into new myocytes. So this was encouraging, but we knew that this process with just these three genes was relatively inefficient in vitro, and we knew that we had room for improvement even in vivo. And so we embarked uh, upon a chemical screen where we, uh, Tamara Mohammed, who a, has a pharmacy, pharmacist background, uh, is a postdoc in the lab who screened over 5,000 small molecule compounds to ask, could any of them make this process more efficient? And it turns out that uh, he identified about 20 different chemical compounds that could if we measured the number of cells that were turning on a cardiac-specific reporter, in this case alpha-myosin heavy chain, uh, at about two weeks after introducing these genes. And you can see here the number of hits ranged from a fold increase from uh, two to seven-fold. And what we're encouraged by is that about four of these uh, 19 hits all folk, uh, affected the TGF-beta signaling pathway, and about four of them affected the Wnt signaling pathway. Both of them are very important signaling pathways in uh, various embryologic pathways. So the fact that we are hitting the same pathways multiple times encouraged us that these actually might be true hits. And in fact, we showed that these small molecules were working specifically through these pathways. So it turns out that uh, these small molecules not only increased the number of cells that could convert, they also accelerated the pace of reprogramming. So normally in a dish, it takes about six weeks of the, for these cells to convert their fate all the way to a beating cardiomyocyte. And uh, with the TGF-beta inhibitor, this process was accelerated, so it happened within about three weeks. And most remarkably, when we added both inhibitors, it, we could see beating cells in a dish as early as just one week after introducing the genes. So this is really quite remarkable if you think about it, the wholesale epigenetic shift that has to occur for a cell to go from one cell type to another just within a, a week uh, and induce this process. And we have interrogated that process quite carefully, and we're beginning to see how the epigenome changes. And it all happens actually within the first few days in this setting, which is really quite remarkable. So we wanted to really know, can these chemicals improve the ability of these genes to reprogram in vivo and improve the function? And it turns out that if we repeat the experiment that I showed you earlier, uh, and now do it by injecting not only the genes with the vi virus into the heart, but now also treat the animals with these chemical inhibitors of Wnt and TGF-beta for a couple of weeks. Now we see actually more, much more robust formation of new muscle. So what you see here is the control setting, where at the apex of the heart, down at the bottom of the heart, if you section, you see a lot of scar tissue. And that gets a little bit less as you go higher up in the ventricle. In comparison, in this setting where we've put both genes and compounds, even at the apex, all of this region right here that you see is now muscle, by our reporter is all, are all cells that used to be non-muscle. So we're getting a lot more muscle formation, about five times as much as without the compounds. And if we look at the function of the heart by measuring what we call the ejection fraction, which is the fraction of blood squeezed out of the heart with every beat, and we measure the decline in the ejection fraction over time by doing ultrasounds at, on a weekly basis, what you can appreciate in the red and green lines is the decline that we saw with either just a control virus or control virus plus the chemicals alone, which didn't make a lot of difference. The purple line shows you the change in ejection fraction with just the genes, which is better. 
And then the blue line is the change with the genes plus these chemical inhibitors, which you can see is significantly better than even with the genes alone, and happens actually very quickly as early as a week, consistent with what uh, we found, the, the rapidity of reprogramming. So we're, we're hopeful that now we've got a, a better combination that can actually improve the heart function even more significantly in this setting. But what I've shown you so far is just mouse, and obviously we'd like to translate this towards the human condition. And so it turned out that the, the three genes I mentioned to you in mouse actually did nothing in a human cardiac fibroblast. So we had to go back and ask, what are we missing? And it turns out that the addition of two more genes were enough, and again, these are transcription factors also, to reprogram a human cardiac fibroblast to be more like a, uh, what we saw in the mouse of a human-induced cardiac myocyte. But in mouse, we had seen that the efficiency in vivo is a lot better than in vitro. And so we pushed forward with trying to test this combination in a heart that's larger, like the human, uh, namely the pig. And its pig's heart is physiologically more similar to the human. And the three mouse genes alone didn't do the trick in human cells either. So we thought this was a good system to know if this might work in human, heart, in human hearts. And so, uh, so far what we've done is use this retrovirus, uh, which only infects dividing cells, and we haven't done it yet with the chemicals, but what we have done is the following. We've taken pigs uh, and blown up a balloon in their left anterior descending artery, which is the one that's commonly occluded in humans in an infarct. Uh, we've created a big infarct and waited three days, put these pigs into an MRI machine, to uh, determine the degree of cardiac dysfunction that we are, we're left with. And then, two days later, we've treated these mice, these pigs, with uh, gene therapy using a retrovirus that infects dividing cells, the fibroblasts namely, and not the myocytes. And then waited two months, put them back in the machine, measured if there's any improvement in their cardiac function. So this we did a bit to mimic the human condition. and. Uh, what you're seeing here are the results of that experiment in a group of about five pigs with, treated with the factors and uh, uh, four pigs with controls. And uh, we haven't done it yet with the most robust uh, effort with the chemicals or with the, really the proper gene therapy vector. But despite that, what we're seeing is if you compare the uh, change in ejection fraction from the point uh, where there's been damage and compare every pig to itself over time, uh, what we can see is that there's a, a significant difference between the treated pigs and the control pigs uh, over that two-month period. Uh, so this type of difference uh, of about 7% in the absolute ejection fraction is significant. It's about a 25% relative improvement from where they started. And we think that we can actually even do much better than this uh, with testing it with these chemical inhibitors that I mentioned and with a proper vector that can get into more of the cardiac fibroblast. So we've tested whether or not these chemical inhibitors I mentioned actually help the human cardiac fibroblast reprogramming also, and it turns out they do. And not only do they help the reprogramming like they did in mouse, it turns out that it simplifies the gene cocktail that's required to only the three genes that you see here uh, that can give us pretty good reprogramming with these human cardiac fibroblasts that you see have these nice patterns that we call sarcomeres uh, in these cells. So the reason this is important is that with this combination, we're getting down to a small enough uh, number of genes that you could imagine packaging those genes in a gene therapy vector that's non-integrating in the genome, which would be the most clinically viable approach. And that approach would involve an adeno-associated vector. Now, the problem with adeno-associated vectors turned out to be that if you wanted to infect a cardiac myocyte, we actually have great AAVs to do that. But if you want to infect a cardiac fibroblast, which would be our target in this therapeutic approach, none of the currently available AAVs do that very well. And so to overcome this obstacle, uh, we took advantage of the fact that our colleague David Schaefer at Berkeley had developed this error-prone AAV library where there are millions of random mutations that are going on in these AAVs 
Uh, so you can choose from those, that, those millions and try to identify one that has tropism for a human, and in our case, pig cardiac fibroblast, uh, over a human cardiac myocyte. So the way we did that is we did rounds of selection asking, are there any AAVs in this pool of millions that can efficiently infect human cardiac fibroblasts? And then we take those and ask to remove those that could efficiently infect a human embryonic stem cell drive cardiac myocyte. And we did this round of selection about seven times and finally came up with an AAV that had, in fact, greater tropism for a human cardiac fibroblast. So then the question is, can this vector actually express high enough levels of these reprogramming factors to actually convert the cell? And uh, so we cloned in our the genetic material into this vector, put them into a human cardiac fibroblast. And what you see here is a cell that used to be a fibroblast, and I think you can appreciate is vigorously beating just one week after introducing these genes. So we feel like we've now got uh, a good cocktail that can be used to induce cell fate conversion. We've got a good vector to deliver these, and we're ready now to do the final uh, trials in large animals before moving this technology towards a human clinical trial. And there are many hurdles that have to be overcome still in terms of safety issues and delivery, uh, but we can begin to see a line of sight towards the clinical application of this reprogramming technology. And this notion of harnessing cells in your body to reprogram them to the type that you want is really not unique to the heart, but in fact could be utilized for many different organs in the body because all we have to do is to be able to crack the code, if you will, for what are the minimal essential genes that will dictate a, a cell fate and then introduce that in the proper organ uh, in that setting. And uh, others have now begun to show this for a variety of different organs, including cells in the brain, the liver, pancreas, spinal cord, et cetera. And so we believe that this paradigm of in vivo cellular reprogramming could be used for many different organs that might benefit from a regenerative approach. And I think we'll see that in the coming years. So what I've shown you today is how we can utilize the knowledge of the key developmental biology networks that are involved in cell fate determination and organogenesis. I've shown it to you for the heart, but the same is going on for many different organs in the body. And how we can use that information to both understand the basis at a deep mechanistic level of human birth defects, but also how we can apply that knowledge to regenerative medicine in the adult. So with that, uh, I'd just like to thank the members of the laboratory that did the work that I shared with you. Those individuals are shown here and range from very talented graduate students and postdocs to uh, very dedicated research assistants. Uh, and uh, we've had a number of uh, collaborators uh, throughout our scientific community that have greatly contributed to the work. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope this has been informative.